of the new CUNY Medical School. And that's Dr. Victoria Tweedo. And I, I've asked uh, Dr. Tweedo to uh, uh, let us know uh, how, how it was. As you know, uh, a lot of her classmates, uh, including her, um, uh, were given the option of graduating early and getting out in the field and helping with the COVID mess. So um, that, that's, uh, that's why we're all gathered here. And without further ado, uh, if I can find where it is, okay. Okay, Victoria, you are now the host. We are all listening, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone, welcome. Thank you, Philip, for that wonderful introduction. Um, welcome everyone who came, especially all those of you who know me personally, you probably know most of these stories. Um, so thank you for your support. I'm going to, I put together a little PowerPoint just to guide our conversation. And then I figured, you know, if at any point anyone wants to interject by all means, I'm happy to explain further. And definitely at the end, we'll have time for conversation, questions, concerns, any further details. I hope that sounds like a good plan to everyone. So I'm going to just share my PowerPoint with all of you. Hang on one minute. And I'm going to put it out. OK. Everyone see what we're looking at? OK, great. Um, so first of all, we are talking about joining the fight against New York City's COVID outbreak. Um, you are all familiar with COVID-19, the pandemic that has not only swept the world, um, it's affected, because I think that's a very large scale macro view, but it's affected almost every single person individually on very deep levels. So we'll talk about what I chose to do during this time. Um, I graduated, as we stated earlier, from the CUNY School of Medicine in May of 2020, I think officially April of 2020, and now I am an internal medicine resident, completing my first year at Montefiore Einstein in the Bronx. Okay, so I didn't travel too far from the city college, as we could tell. <laughs> and let's see if I can. So I just wanted to start with a quick story to give you all some context for what a day could be like while we were working during COVID. Um, so I just kind of wrote down my thoughts and I'll read it to you and you're welcome to read along. Uh, it's 12 o'clock and I'm getting my first chance to sit down and breathe. I open my lunch bag and it goes off that crinkle, the pop of the overhead speaker, rapid response on 4B. I know in my gut that my patient this morning was right to be afraid of intubation. I inhale quickly before throwing on my N95, get upstairs and try to catch the breath that won't penetrate this mask. As I see the crowd of nurses outside my patient's room, I already know what is happening. Everyone is in there, vital signs are plummeting and it's obvious that my patient's going to need mechanical ventilation. I know I can't contribute to everything occurring. So I grab the patient's hand and get their attention through their deteriorating status. I let them know that there will be a tube down their throat, but that we're still going to do our best to take care of them. The only comfort I can take is that they want everything possible done to keep them alive, and we were attempting that. The paralytics are administered, the patient's vocal cords are swiftly located, and the tube is slipped easily down the trachea. The process of intubation evokes complicated emotions under normal circumstances. Breathing is now steady and dependable, but with COVID, it felt more like a brief respite before further complications. The sedation is hung and the room clears out and all you can hear is the Darth Vader hum. In that space, I start to consider what I could have done better and say a small prayer for a positive outcome. And I think we all want to know, how did I get into that situation? So how did it all start? Um, it all started when I was in high school. I heard about this program called Sophie Davis from my mom, who was initially a bookkeeper and decided to go back to school for a change of career. And she decided she wanted to go into medicine and become a physician assistant. And she heard of this little school in Harlem that was creating amazing physician assistants all across the New York City area. And she at the time was not the conventional student. She was older, she had children. She had had a lot of life experience prior. You know, most of the time PA school you think of, young people who are just fresh out of college or it's essentially not necessarily my mom, even though she looks pretty young. Um, I won't say what her age was exactly, but 
I remember she went for the interview and she just had loved the space, the environment, the people, the culture. And she came home and she's like, you know, I think I'm meant to be there. And lo and behold, the next day she was accepted. And that started my relationship with Sophie Davis through her. Um, And I came to learn it as a place of inclusion of high quality education and was really regardless of age, race or socioeconomic background. And personally, I come from a a small private high school where everyone had very similar backgrounds. It was just very homogeneous and this was going to be the complete and polar opposite. And I think it's also important to mention how I ended up going into medicine in the first place. How did I decide that a seven year program um, with getting your bachelor's and getting your medical degree, you're really taking a big commitment at age 18. How did I know it was for me? Um, I think what I can say is I was always the natural nurturer of the group in general. I was very caring. I loved playing the caretaker role. Um, I loved biology. I loved the human body. I loved all the things about sciences. And I really wanted a dynamic and limitless field because I just wanted to constantly be challenged. I didn't want one day to look like the next. And I thought that medicine really fit that description. And the last reason, and the reason that I think is the most important is I wanted to be there for people when they were the most human. I think that, especially in this day and age where we have social media and Zoom and all these virtual things, medicine is just humankind and humanity stripped down to its rawest components. And I just, I wanted to be a part of that and to be part of that process and be there for people during that time. So, Now let's talk about my time at City College when I was in Sophie Davis and CUNY School of Medicine, the activities and things that I engaged in. Um, Our, actually our freshman English course was narrative medicine, which is loosely defined as medicine practice with narrative competence, not a great definition. So I'll go a little bit further and say, it's using literature, creative arts, writing, to help doctors become more, and all forms of clinicians, PAs, nurses, all ancillary staff to become more sensitive and competent providers and to just become more empathetic. So initially it started using creative writing, both expressive writing and reading and digesting reading pieces. And now the narrative medicine scope has gone as wide as music and art and using all of the humanities to influence how you elicit stories from your patients, how you relay those stories, and how you can be empathetic and experience those stories with your patients. Um, And then falling into this narrative medicine actually took me on a very long journey and I was able to serve as a facilitator for the uh, younger classes at Sophie Davis and the CUNY School of Medicine. I attended national conferences and I also was able to attend an intensive in the training course for narrative medicine. And I will say that I use the skills that I picked up on how to be a good storyteller and a good story elicitor every day. And also just picking up on the nuances of patient stories is very important. And I definitely picked up that skill through narrative medicine. Um, There was excellent mentorship. My personal mentor was Dr. Isaac Dapkins. He graduated from Sophie Davis well before I did, but in my second year of college, so quite some time ago, he was my, um, a doctor that I had to shadow. And then from then on, we essentially worked together and he was really an exemplary person, but also he just kind of was the CUNY School of Medicine, Sophie Davis motto personified. And he really lived that out and manifested it into a total career. And we actually did a lot of work together, including research around HIV testing at federally qualified health centers um, about essentially we were looking at health centers that had populations that spoke primarily one language. And if people were felt more comfortable to get care there, specifically HIV testing, um, which indeed they did, um, were actually our poster was accepted to the NYU Health Disparity Conference last year before COVID. And we also were accepted to the SGIM, which is a large national conference for internal medicine. Um, and we really worked very nicely together, but I think it was great to see somebody who had gone through Sophie Davis and really created a career with that message. Um, and then also while I was at Sophie Davis, I had a lot of opportunity for leadership. I was able to serve on the student government for two years. 
And I really appreciated that opportunity to serve as the liaison between the student body and the faculty. It wasn't just organizing picnics and fun activities to de-stress, but it also there were certain challenges that came up that we really needed to make sure student voices were heard and that faculty would act. And I think they were very responsive and very open to listening to what we had to say. And it gave me an opportunity to become both closer with the faculty and with my fellow CUNY School of Medicine and Sophie Davis uh, student colleagues. And I hate to sound cheesy, but it is the absolute truth. Um, one of the best things to come out of my experience while at City College are my friends who are really not friends, they're really my family. Um, after you spend seven years with people, you, they just become a part of your life. And I am looking forward to uh, you know, hopefully when we are alumni very far down the road, also reminiscing on our time at City College. And without them, I don't think I would have gotten through this program. Um, and the other important thing I should highlight is that at around year three of seven, we did become the inaugural class. And being the first is memorable for both the challenges and the rewards. So we really had to work in tandem with the staff and the faculty at CUNY School of Medicine to you know, first of all, improve on things as they were happening, but also try and work on what would happen for the following years that would be coming up after us. And I think that we were really able to do a collaborative effort and create hopefully uh, the foundation for what will be a longstanding and wonderful medical establishment and medical school. Okay, so while I was at my last year, Sophie Davis, fourth year of medical school is the last year of CUNY School of Medicine and the last year of the Sophie Davis program. Um, you know, usually it's actually a time to relax and go on trips and uh, really make up for all that lost time you spent studying. But COVID came in and completely threw us off track. It started off very, I know everyone has their story, but for me, I was working in the emergency room at St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx. And it started off as a, oh, there's this virus somewhere far away and we're not sure what's going to happen. And then it very quickly turned into the first case in the emergency room and then escalated to canceled rotations. And as soon as that happened, there were some rumors about an early graduation date and then indeed early graduation date was announced. Um, and I think that, you know, some people would say like, oh, that's quite exciting. You know, you get to be done with medical school early, but this season of the year, which just happens to turn out that it's that this time of year right now, um, is called match season. And this week, actually, tomorrow, everyone all fourth year medical students will be finding out whether they match, well, where they matched for a residency position. And it's arguably like, you know, the pinnacle of medical school, even more important than graduation, because this is essentially what we work for. Um, and it's usually a very large celebration that we do all together. Um, and unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to cancel that celebration because we couldn't all physically be together. And though I was very fortunate, I don't know if you guys can see in the right corner, I look quite happy standing next to somebody who looks exactly like me, but with glasses, that's my older brother, Josh. Um, he also matched into internal medicine last year. So I did have someone in my pod to celebrate with and go through the ups and downs of the emotions with. Uh, he actually, as you'll hear later, works at Staten Island University Hospital, which is where I did most of my clinical training and um, where we both ended up working during COVID. So that is just a funny way how the universe works. Um, personally, I'm not just, you know, match day celebrations necessarily being modified. Personally, I had to postpone my wedding that had been planned for March 29th. Um, and the whole time of the year was just, you know, as you all remember, there was a ton of uncertainty. There was fear, there was misinformation, a ton of illness and on, of course, the deepest sorrow of levels is how many people were dying and so quickly. I don't need to remind all of you of the horrible photos and things that we would see every night. And I think on the deepest of levels was hearing about our colleagues and our family members um, who were working through devastating and dangerous conditions. My sister-in-law, so I'm this this brother's wife, she's a wonderful nurse who was working on a COVID floor. Um, also at Staten Island University Hospital, we're very much rooted in our community. Um, you know, she would tell us stories and we were just, we were very concerned for her, but 
you have to think about the fact that when you spend two and a half, two years in a hospital working with the house staff, working with the attendings and all those doctors, they're not just doctors and nurses who are putting themselves at risk, they're also your friends and people who took time to train you and really looked out for you. And then we were just kind of home concerned for their well-being and just, and we knew what kind of war they were fighting in there. Uh, there was a lot of obviously fear in general just circulating around. So then we were faced obviously with a choice. I should make that clear. Nobody was forced to work in the hospital or volunteer to work or forced to do anything. It was all on a volunteer basis. So when the early graduation was announced, it was with the intention of providing more clinicians for the COVID fight. And, but again, as I said, it was a volunteer basis. I would say for me, I would love to say I just jumped at the opportunity right away, um, but I definitely had to give it some thought. I was hesitant. There's this internal conflict of, of course you wanna help, you wanna work hard, you wanna do something with this degree that they're now granting you with all the years of training that you have behind you. Um, but I was also dealing with the fact personally, there was a lot of lost time and opportunities because this was the part of the year that was supposed to be like the pinnacle of my medical school experience. Um, and I know that sounds selfish, but uh, that is where I was mentally at. And of course there was legitimate fear of getting sick, of getting the people that I lived with sick. Uh, there were reports of PPE shortages. There was just, again, a lot of speculation and fear circulating around. And I would love to just say that as soon as I heard it, I jumped at the opportunity, but I definitely took the time to contemplate and debate. But uh, eventually what it came to was that we were in a very scary time where I had no control over anything whatsoever. And it felt like this was the opportunity to get in there and to do something because I couldn't just sit home and let things happen. It's just not the person that I am. It's not the person that I was learning to be at the CUNY School of Medicine at Sophie Davis. You know, they tell us if you see something is wrong, if you see that somebody needs your help, you need to jump on it, you need to act on it. And I needed to embody those morals and to embody those values um, that I was instilled in, in my education and my family life in general. And it felt like going in and working with COVID would be the only thing that would be in alignment with who I truly was, despite those conflicting feelings. So I ended up going to work at Staten Island University Hospital, which um, you should know, Staten Island is the fifth mostly forgotten borough of New York City. If you've never been there, I don't know if you're missing out on much, but um, I think it's a lovely place. <laughs> and I did most of my medical school rotations there, it just happens to be that that's one of the hospitals that the CUNY School of Medicine is affiliated with. And it was really amazing growing up there and then returning back as a medical student and taking care of the people that I grew up alongside with. I can't even tell you how many people I recognize, but also just the general personas of people from around the neighborhood that you could really relate to. Um, so we can start. I, I know Roses and Thorns is probably something, a game you haven't played in a long time, but I think it's a really good analogy for what this COVID work was. Um, a rose is obviously beautiful and it's it smells nice. It has lots of nice things to offer, but it's comprised of both the beautiful flower aspect and the stem that can have many thorns. So the roses are the high, the great aspects of the work and then the thorns were the difficult part. So we can start with the roses. Um, I'd say number one for me was getting to work with my best friend and my older brother serving the community we all grew up in. Um, this, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but you can see my brother and I are sitting on the windowsill just taking a quick break after rounds. This is my very dear friend, Lisa. She is, we graduated together. We have done Sophie Davis together from essentially day one. Um, she's also from Staten Island and she is now working as an intern at Staten Island University Hospital as well. So it was amazing to work with them in a clinical aspect because I wasn't going to get that opportunity again and to watch them shining as new doctors as well. It was really amazing connecting people to family members who were stuck outside the hospital. I think that, you know, before COVID, we took for granted being able to visit people in the hospital. And I can tell you even now with limited visitation hours in the hospital that I work at, it's very, very difficult for people who are ill to sit in the hospital all day and not be able to see their family members face to face, to hold their hands, to hear their voices, especially if somebody is intubated. You know, we don't necessarily know whether people can hear or not, but 
it's up to your own beliefs. And I, I do believe that people can hear you talking. Um, so I can't even imagine people sitting in an ICU for days on end and they never heard their family's voices. They only hear strangers' voices, the doctors that come in, the doctors that come out, the nurse that's changing them, whoever it is. Um, and getting that opportunity because, you know, when you're working as a nurse, you have a lot of patients to take care of. You have to do, take care of medications, make sure the vital sign, there's just a lot of work, hands-on work. When you're the doctor, you're busy as well, but you have a little more time to grab that iPad and to call the family and to have them FaceTime. And the, just the change in patients' demeanors when that happens and they get to see their family, even if it's just a virtual phone call or just to hear their voices, it's honestly almost miraculous. Personally, I had a patient who was uh, Fujianese speaking and she, everyone thought she had altered mental status and that she was confused. We were using the translator phone. Nothing was going well. She wasn't really answering us. And I kind of gave up on everything. And I figured, you know, I'm just going to FaceTime her family and see how this goes. And the minute she heard her son's voice, she complete 180. She was awake. She was talking. She was participating. She was eating and drinking. And I just think that we can't underestimate how much um, energy and strength we can get from our loved ones. And that was just one example for me. Um, another rose was sort of getting to enjoy the, the tail end of the good stories when there were patients who had been sick for a very long time. And then they came to our unit and they were still, you know, they still had COVID, but they were in the recovery period and sort of over that very dangerous hump. Um, and just being a part of their story and getting to watch them leave the hospital was really, really rewarding and reminded us why we were here doing this work. Um, a story that I would personally like to share another one about this point. I had a patient, he was around 50 years old, never had any medical conditions, perfectly healthy man. He got COVID, he was intubated for an extended amount of time. He was not doing well at all. They were sure that he was never gonna come out of this. He even required, because he was intubated for so long, he needed a procedure to put a little hole in his neck so that they could put um, ventilate him that way. That's usually what we do for people who have been intubated for an extended amount of time. And by the time I met him, he was definitely on the up and up, but he was losing steam. I think what people forget about, like just because you got out of the intensive care unit, all your problems are not over yet. He had lost his ability to walk because he all of his muscles had broken down since he had not been walking for over a month. He could not feed himself. He couldn't dress himself. He couldn't do anything that his normal life was used to. And he was starting to realize that and it was really dawning on him and he was very, very frustrated. And the next step after the hospital for him was to go to a rehab center to regain his strength. But there came a point where he was growing very stubborn and frustrated and angry and honestly justifiably so because of what he was going through. And I remember just taking the time to go talk to him and see how he's doing and maybe try and cheer him up. Um, you know, I tend to have a pretty good sense of humor. So I figured maybe that would work a little bit. I don't know. And I go talk to him and he's telling me that he doesn't want to FaceTime his family because he just gets more homesick when he sees them on the camera together and he's not there. And then he was telling me about that he has a little white fluffy dog that he really misses and that he is so concerned that the dog might pass because it was a very old dog. So he thought the dog might pass away before he gets home. And his goal was to get home so that he could be there with his dog and like not miss out on the rest of her life. And I mean, personally, I think we all love dogs, but I also have an older white fluffy dog. And I just remember maybe I was emotionally saturated, but I, I almost broke down with him because I, I knew that feeling. The best feeling is going home after a long day and petting your dog. And he just was giving, honestly, he was giving up. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to do anything. He didn't want to participate in any therapy. And I was like, okay, I don't, I didn't learn this in medical school. I don't necessarily know how to deal with this, but I don't think this is a medical issue. This is more of a, a human issue, something that I need to think about what he's going through. So I called his wife and I asked her to send me a photo of his daughter and the dog and maybe just a nice family picture so that I could remind him what he was fighting for. Because sometimes even when we give up on ourselves and we don't want to fight for ourselves, um, having great family and good support to come back to is the reason enough to fight. So 
we located the one color printer in the whole hospital. We printed out the photos. And when his lunch tray showed up, I snuck into the room and I said, you know, are you going to eat anything? He's like, no, I'm not hungry. I don't want anything. And I said, listen, I know you're frustrated. I know you're tired. I know you're weary, but I want to remind you what you're fighting for and why you're here and how you made it this far. And I took out the photo and he absolutely lost and started crying. I think we all started crying because it reminded us what we were fighting for too, day in and day out. We weren't just fighting for the patients themselves, but you're really fighting to keep families together. And I think that realizing that in that moment and that I get to be a part of that was really something that I couldn't I couldn't even fully grasp and I still don't fully grasp, but um, it's a great privilege and it's an honor. Oof, sorry. <laughs> I think I'm getting a little emotional remembering all these times that I spent with these people. Um, and I guess that's an easy segue into the next point was feeling like I was making some sort of a difference in a sea of despair. I think that, I don't know, I medically advanced any care that much because when you're brand new intern in May, not even in July. Um, they help you out a lot with the clinical aspect of things, but it felt like, you know, those FaceTime calls, those, whatever it was, making sure people got the snacks they wanted or the extra blanket they needed. It felt like I was doing something and I wasn't just hopeless at home and feeling like I couldn't have any control whatsoever. And I think what was also really incredible about doing this work was for seven years, we were looking forward to match day. We were looking forward to graduation. Those were our lights at the end of the tunnel. And what I came to realize is that those were more like superficial lights. That's not really what the exciting part is. You lose sight of what actually is important, which is getting the opportunity to do the job that you have been working for. It's oftentimes you're stressed because there's, you're working so many hours or you're exhausted or a million other reasons, but it really, getting to do this work gave purpose to the work that we had put in as a class, as individuals for seven years. You know, most people do medical school for four years, but I had been on this journey with my classmates for a very long time, and this was sort of the culmination of it, and it was exceptionally meaningful. Um, now to get to the thorns, which are obviously the less enjoyable and honest, very emotional aspects of the COVID work that I did. Number one, uh, there was a lot of death. I think, you know, obviously I was a medical student, so I did deal with losing patients, but before COVID, most of the time the death could be expected. It wasn't as, like there wasn't as high of a volume. In this situation, there was a lot of death very quickly and under the worst of circumstances. The family members could not come see them. They couldn't be with them while they were passing away. Um, and then it's just, you knew that they were there for a long time before they passed away without seeing their family members. And I, I mean, for me, it was my first head-on experience with a large amount of death in a short amount of time. And there's nothing as humbling as putting your stethoscope to a chest and not hearing anything knocking back at you. And I think that really made it very real for me. And I realized this is what we were getting ourselves into. But I also realized that I needed to take the time to, even if the patient is comfort care and they're not having any active escalation of their treatment, it's just to spend a minute or two, whisper in their ear, make sure they know they're not alone and that somebody is there for them because that was really all we could do for a lot of people. Another thorn that I did see and I continue to see not just, I'm not saying, you know, all medical practitioners go through this is burnout um, in trainees and clinical staff. Uh, New York City especially was hit exceptionally hard and all, honestly, all over the country and people are being spread very thin, especially before the vaccine times when people would fall ill. Obviously, they couldn't come to work. It was a lot of patients and not a lot of staff and that low that ratio can really be very exhausting, especially for the nursing staff and the ancillary staff. Um, and you can see burnout very quickly. I think that I just wanted to bring this to everyone's attention because it's important as an issue, as a medical field that we need to pay attention to because we're just now seeing the ramifications. And I think that it will continue to follow. COVID is traumatic to everyone involved. And then especially to people who were there watching people 
dealing with COVID before we had a lot of information. Um, so I just wanted to share that we need to support our physicians, our PAs, our nurses, our ancillary staff, everyone who works in the hospital from the person cleaning the rooms to the person making the coffee without them, we wouldn't have gotten through. And each of those people are really subject to burnout. Um, another thorn was getting COVID. I, I did get COVID while I was working. Fortunately for me, I was pretty much okay. I only really lost my taste and smell. And till, till this day though, I mean, coffee doesn't taste the same. So I guess that's a reminder to myself that I, I experienced COVID. But it was initially a little bit scary, but thankfully I had a very mild course and compared to my patients, I did okay. And the last thorn that for me was having our family members worried about us. Again, you know, just the uncertainty that we had going into it, then we were within the field itself. The people on the outside still felt that nervousness. And I just remember everyone being very anxious most of the time, but thankfully we were okay. And I did want to note this man right here um, holding the sign. He would get, it says, uh, thank you, healthcare workers. We are all in this until the end. Let's work together. And I can't see what the bottom, oh, listen to the experts. This guy would stand outside the hospital every single day from at least 6.30 in the morning, God bless his soul. And he would be waving that outside the parking lot at every person who was driving into work. So I would always wave at him and give him a smile. And I thought that was so impressive that he would wake up every morning to make sure that we were thanked. And the house across the street from the main atrium of the hospital, they are, they must be artists, I think, but they created a, a huge art display that said, thank you across their whole front lawn. So I think that even though these are small touches, they're gestures that really can make a difference in somebody's day. And I really appreciated seeing him every morning. Okay, so then in the midst of COVID work, I did graduate, we had our actual graduation ceremony, which was slated to be a large event because we were the inaugural class and uh, it was still a beautiful event. I think once again, it had its, the things that were difficult, the things that were great, uh, the things that were difficult was I didn't get to celebrate with my classmates who, as I mentioned before, are essentially like family at this point. Um, we definitely wanted to physically be together for this momentous occasion. Uh, I also was really looking forward to the faculty meeting my family the faculty that had been there for me for a very long time and really watched me go from this 18 year old kid to becoming a doctor. I wanted them to meet my parents, my spouse, everybody, but that didn't happen. Maybe one day I'll have a reunion and make it happen. Um, it was hard to have some family that had to be far away for the ceremony, but I was thankful that we were able to Zoom and everyone was able to see the ceremony. Um, and then what was really amazing was we, each got to choose who hooded us. We get a hood, um, you can see it right over here on this top picture dangling off. And the hood is usually given to you by a physician to welcome you into the practicing medicine. So we obviously didn't have any doctors on hand, but I got to be hooded by the people that really truly got me to this point. And that is my spouse in the upper right, or I guess, yeah, right coroner and my parents, my mom and dad who were there from the very beginning to make sure that I could, you know, support me so I could succeed and get through to this point. And I will say the Hippocratic Oath really had a lot more meaning than I would have imagined. Um, just reading those words and realizing that that was the work that I was doing every day made it very strong and very poignant. Um, I certainly had some ugly crying, which is why I did not include a picture from that point of the ceremony. Um, but it was, it was definitely a privilege to be able to put those words into action. Uh, and then just some lessons learned because I wouldn't wanna leave you all without <laughs> something to take from this talk or something useful to take from this talk, I should say. The first rule or first lesson that I wanna bring up is to be a person first. I think that that is the CUNY School of Medicine, the Sophie Davis hallmark is that we are human beings first, the people that we treat are human beings first, and then the medicine comes in after that. 
medicine is the business of taking care of people. It's not just a disease. It's not just a medication. It's not just a bed number. It is a human. And you need to treat that person how you would like to be treated if you were laying in that bed. And I always say, if, even if so, you should be treating them. If that person doesn't look like you or doesn't sound like you or doesn't act like you, it doesn't matter. Look at them as if they could be your grandma or your grandpa or your cousin and treat them as family. And then that would really make sure that you are treating them with the respect and the dignity and the commitment that you should be treating each person with. And always to prioritize patient care and stand up for what is right. I think that as burnout becomes a bigger issue, sometimes things can get overlooked or you know, people are just a little bit numb to the needs of patients and we need to make sure that we prioritize patient care. We get them what they need. We treat them the way they're supposed to be treated. And even when everyone is okay with something, if you're not okay with it, you have to speak up and make sure that you try to make a difference in the situation. Another lesson I learned is humor at appropriate times can be very helpful. Um, in the midst of all that death and darkness and gloom, we were actually having a pretty wonderful time working together because the providers that I worked with, including my brother, my best friend, and all the other residents and interns, we tried to make the work light. We acknowledge the dark moments, but when we could enjoy and we could relax and we could just kind of hang out and be people, we capitalized on those opportunities as well. So it's always important to try and keep something lighthearted when you can and when it's appropriate. Um, another important lesson would be self-care. This goes for anyone and everyone. And the five components I like to think of self-care in five different ways, and that is physical, spiritual, relational, psychological, creative expression. Physical being movement, so just going out for a walk, getting in some exercise, just moving your body. Spiritual doesn't have to be religious or anything like that, but it's just the idea of being part of something that's greater than yourself relational, you know, I don't even know if that's the real word for this, but maintaining relationships with those that matter to you, be it a friend, be it a colleague, be it anyone, um, they want to hear from you and you probably want to hear from them. Psychological, um, our psyches, doesn't matter whether you're in the medical field or not as well, you need to take care of it. So talking about your feelings, journaling, and making sure that you're in touch with what you're feeling. And creative expression is using art, whatever art form you feel most comfortable in to express whatever you might be feeling. And most importantly, last but not least, that in every challenge, there's a chance to learn something new. When we're faced with a challenge, it's usually a situation that we just don't know what to do. And I think that can be very intimidating, but I learned essentially, you just have to take action and you're gonna to get to the other side. And once you're there, you'll have a lesson to take with you so that you can apply it in the future and not to be afraid of the challenge, but rather to face it head on. And then I included one bonus slide just cause you know, now that we're, we're not done with COVID, but I've moved forward from the COVID times and my CUNY School of Medicine days to working at Montefiore Hospital system here in the Bronx. Um, it felt like a natural progression. It's got a lot of the same culture that we had at Sophie Davis in the CUNY School of Medicine. And I use my training skills regularly in my professional, my personal life, um, my end of life conversations with my patients. Um, I use the skills that I, I gathered during COVID rather quickly, unfortunately. Um, even today, I work with palliative care in the last couple of weeks, and I've been using a lot of the experience I've had with my COVID patients to fuel these conversations with family members. We, I've continued to advocate for patients and their families, considering that, again, families are really not allowed in the hospital for a longer time. So the same idea of when I was working during COVID and I would try to act on behalf of the family members, I still do the same thing. I still use my cultural sensitivity training, my narrative medicine skills. And this past year, with all its ups and downs, has made me extra grateful to be able to do this work of being a doctor, especially the sleepless days and sometimes nights. Um, I really feel privileged. And I know that without CUNY School of Medicine, Sophie Davis and all my time at City College, that wouldn't be possible. And I am using my time during my residency to learn as much as possible to ensure that my patients get the best possible care. Um, and essentially everything you heard here today is brought to you by of the names that you can see on the panel of people listening to this, but I just wanted to say thank you to my incredible support system. They've been supporting my lofty endeavors from 
day one, I have a wonderful husband, my parents, all four of them. I have five siblings, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, cousins, my dog, Chloe. She's great. Um, just basically always being there to celebrate the highs and highs and supporting me through the lows. And they really restore me so that I can take care of my patients. I'm grateful to my fellow Sophies and all my co-interns and co-residents who have been training alongside me. Uh, I think that for every clinician, nurse, whoever you see working in a hospital, there's someone and a team behind them that helps them be who they are to give to their patients because it can't be a one person job. Uh, and with that, I will open it up to questions, comments. I'd love to hear from all of you. Hi, this is, my name is Paul Schwartz. I'm from the Bronx originally and a little bit familiar with Montefiore Hospital. You mentioned your end of life conversations. To me, that would seem like the most difficult thing you'd have to do. How do you manage that? That's a really good question. So especially for right now, since I'm working with a palliative care service, um, it starts with really listening to what patients, well, ideally we start the conversation before patients are end of life. What makes it difficult is when patients are no longer able to make decisions for themselves and we're dealing with surrogate decision makers, uh, including healthcare proxies or next of kin. And I think you have to go into it knowing that there are two main opinions in the situation, which is one, what you can see as a clinician, whether something will be beneficial or if the medical care is futile at this point. And the other aspect is remembering that this is somebody's family member, that they have values and they could have cultural or religious implications to what they view as meaningful life and trying to marry and merge those two opinions. I don't wanna say it's easy. I think every family is different and grieves in a different way. And every person has an individual definition of what it means to be alive. And that subjectiveness is what makes it meaningful to be part of humankind, but it also makes it very difficult to streamline the process. So I don't know if that answers your question completely, but it's really trying to integrate everyone's opinions and interests together and to come up with a good plan that would prioritize what would be best for the patient. I guess you'll learn more as you go along. Yeah, more definitely. More curious to get with that. Did your sense of smell and taste come back? They technically did. They are they're very altered. <laughs> oh, so gosh. that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess what you have going on. Yeah, oh, I have ahead, a Harvey. question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, could you explain how this seven-year program is structured? We don't know. I mean, this is all new. Uh, sure. And and, sure. and how how Sophie Davis melds with um, the college and the medical school, and how City College and City University are involved in this. I, I mean, this is something I've not been exposed to, so it's new, and not most of us probably don't know unless we're involved as you said, as part of the panel. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so CUNY City University of New York is the overarching parent organization within the CUNY system. There are different schools, junior colleges, full-on universities. So you have like, for example, Brooklyn College, the College of Staten Island, those are all CUNYs. CCNY is with City College of New York. It's a campus located in Harlem. Um, in the West Harlem area. It houses multiple schools. I might be biased towards it, but I think it's the coolest one. Um, it has an architecture school. It has an engineering school. It is now, the CUNY School of Medicine is relatively new. We'll go into what that means exactly, but it houses the CUNY School of Medicine. And I don't know if you can see, um, Robert D'Amico has a picture of the famed Harris Hall as his, um, so that is where this CUNY School of Medicine is based out of, there you go. <laughs> and so it's comprised of a bunch of different um, small schools within City College. It's that one campus. Now, Sophie Davis and CUNY School of Medicine, it's a confusing thing, but essentially before my graduating class, it was structured as a uh, five plus two program. So you would do five years of didactics at City College, including your, your essentially three years of undergraduate classes and then 
two years of your medical school classes, then you would finish at City College, go to another medical school that was affiliated with Sophie Davis, and you would do your clinical rotations or clinical courses, which are essentially working in a hospital for two years and get your medical degree from the affiliated medical school. Now, that was not a sustainable process, and we wanted to have our own medical school where we could be responsible for making the doctors from start to finish. So hence the idea of the CUNY School of Medicine was born and the program changed into a structure of three plus four. So my arithmetic skills have also changed with the, but essentially you do three years of undergraduate studies, you get your bachelor's of science in biomedical sciences. Um, that's all under the City College and the Sophie Davis program. Then you, apply, but you are, as long as you're in good academic standing, it's a very simple application process to the CUNY School of Medicine. And the CUNY School of Medicine is four years built like a traditional medical school education where the first two years are comprised of didactics and essentially in-person learning. And then the last few years are clinical learning where you go to the hospital, you rotate, you do all the different specialties. And at the end of those four years, you match into a residency and then you are, that is where you start your training as, a, you're already a doctor, but you're still in training. So that's where I'm at right now. And you graduate from the CUNY School of Medicine after four years. So that's why when I started, it was initially that five plus two situation and then it switched midway. So we got our undergraduate degrees after three years and had four years of medical school, if that's clear. Okay. I, I see Dara is raising her hand. Yeah, I have a question for you, Dr. Tweedo. I'm a huge fan, by the way. <laughs> um, I uh, was just wondering, a lot of like, not memes, but like kind of like speculation about how uh, students have, who have been in medical, medical school, like I guess more the first three years chunk of it during COVID, how they'll be as doctors. Do you have any like idea of how COVID will have affected um, people in the earlier phases of their medical um, studies? And yeah. Sure, I think that's a great question. Um, I'm a little distracted because my dog Chloe did join the Zoom if you all wanna notice. She definitely helped me get through medical school. Um, to answer your question, the medical students have actually been really resilient. I work with them a lot because we are affiliated with the Einstein School of Medicine and we deal with med students all the time. A lot of them were kicked off their rotations, which is the way that people learn in their third and fourth years of medical school. Um, but I th And they had to interview at, for future jobs virtually. Everything was done virtually. They essentially had to reinvent the whole process of being third and fourth year medical students. And you know, the earlier years are more difficult as well, but I think the, the students in the clinical aspect of medical school probably struggled the most of this because you can't really fabricate the experience of being in a hospital, but you can always take a lecture and put it on Zoom. Um, but I think that in the end of the day, they probably didn't get as much clinical time as they wanted, but thankfully um, residency is long and practice can be very long. So I hope that they'll get to make up that lost time. Um, and I believe in just medical students, really they adapt to anything. So I think they'll be able to pull through. Okay. So one last question, Victoria. A year later now, tomorrow, as you mentioned, is match day. It's a big deal. And for people who don't have any experience uh, with medical school, it's a completely unknown phenomena. Just how exciting is it uh, the evening before match day now, thinking about a year later? <laughs> I feel like I should probably defer to um, Brianna Dillon because she is on the eve of her match day. Um, well, let's ask her. Let's ask her. I think we should bring her in. Brie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Brianna. So like Tori mentioned, um, tomorrow's my match day. I'm going into pediatrics. So I'm very excited to find out where I'll be. Um, it is a very weird feeling. Um, I'm very restless. I've cleaned. 
I've rewatched whole series in a span of a few days. I haven't really slept. Um, <laughs> so we'll see how it goes tomorrow. I'm obviously hoping for the best, but it is a very, I've never felt anything like this before. So it is a very interesting, exciting, nerve wracking feeling um, to experience, but all good things. <laughs> I think I'm feeling those feelings by proxy just because it hasn't been so long ago, but I think you said it perfectly. It's like, it's a major, major pinnacle and that high point of what we are working towards. All of medical school is focused on where you're going to residency. Um, so I think that it's just, it's a sensation you can't explain. And once you find out, you feel a lot better. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hear where our fourth years are going to be going to do amazing work. Um, Peter, I see your hand is raised. Yeah. Um, it just seems to me that like applications to college or graduate school or medical school, when you get past it and can look back at it, it turns out to be usually a no-lose proposition. <laughs> you get into a school, you get into a graduate program, you get into medical school and move on like that. Yes, there may be a disappointment because it wasn't the one, but you're not married to the school. That's a different the one. <laughs> True, I agree. I think I, I was actually just talking with Brianna, actually, and I really have firmly believe that we end up where we are supposed to be. Uh, I feel like that's sort of how my life panned out the way it did. And I ended up at Sophie Davis for a reason, and uh, it led me here. And I think that I agree with you. It's true. Everything is a limited time engagement, and you have the opportunity to make changes whenever you'd like. Um, but I know Bree's gonna shine wherever she goes, so I'm not worried. <laughs> how does it how does it how does it work? Do you do you select three or four places and make application there? Is that is that how, how it works? I'll tell you, it's actually quite complicated, as I can see um, Bob Danico's face. Uh, it's very intricate and quite fascinating. I think if, correct me if I'm wrong, people who created, there is a computer algorithm involved and I'm pretty sure they won a Nobel Peace Prize or something, some significant award for creating this algorithm. Mm -hmm. So it starts like this. You, um, you decide what programs you would like to apply to. You, there is one centralized application that you work exceptionally hard on because it has to be perfect. You should know, I don't know the stats, but there are significantly more medical students and physicians applying for residency spots in the United States than there are spots available. Mm -hmm. So it is very competitive, especially different specialties are very difficult to get into, but it also tends to be self-selecting, but in general, there are not enough spots for all the people applying. So that's just the disclaimer. You put in your application, you select the places that you want to go to. It can also be a very pricey endeavor. You have to pay for every place you apply to. And then before COVID, you would have to travel to the places to interview. Um, and that is granted that you received an interview. You cannot match somewhere without interviewing. So for about eight weeks, you sit there anxiously, compulsively checking your phone. I actually had outsourced my email to my cousin because she is much more tech savvy because if you miss an email, you can literally miss an interview. There's Monica. Um, yeah, the whole crew is here. And you know, you have to book and schedule these interviews like as soon as possible. Then you spend your money going to travel to the place. You have a full day engagement with the hospital. You are on 100% of the time. You interview usually with a program director. You interview with different doctors that work there. And then once that's done, you the last part of the process is you rank all the places that you would be willing to go to. So some people are fortunate and get enough interviews that they can leave a few out if they leave a few places out of their rank list if they don't feel like they would want to go there. But, you know, essentially you try to rank as many programs as possible to increase your likelihood of actually matching. And while you are ranking the programs you want to go to, the programs are ranking the people that they want to come. And then they take these lists of all the programs of all the people applying and they throw them into this algorithm and then they match people up accordingly. Hence, you know, you can be sure. And then the Monday of match week, which is, this is a, this is like a sacred time in medical school. <laughs> this is like a holiday week. Um, so the Monday of match week, you get an email finding out whether you matched or not. So you can breathe a little. And then as if you haven't waited long enough, you have to wait all the way till Friday to find out where it is that you matched. 
So I hope that makes sense, but it's an emotionally, and especially when you have to do it over Zoom and you can't get a sense as well um, of the place that you are committing your life to. Although it's not a marriage, it's a, I, for, I don't know who said that, I'm trying to remember. It's not a marriage, but it's a very, very committed relationship. So you have to make sure that you like where you're going and that they like you. So, so you want to fit in. Is, is it just one match? Correct. You get one place and you are legally obliged to go there. There is not, That's because you are signing an article. You sign off saying, I will attend the place that I match. And and if you don't? Good luck. Yeah, it's just <laughs> it's not even a thing you do. <laughs> so, Brianna knows so wherever you match, you're 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 going. Correct. And, and you've you've pre-selected and skin skinny down the up the 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 alternative. Correct. Um, I mean, I guess the thing that you forget is that um, it, when you're going into the match process, you think, oh, I really hope these places want me. But I think what we need to remind our medical students is that not only do you have to think they want you, but you have to remember, like, they really need you. If a program doesn't match its spots, it doesn't look as appealing to applicants. So I think that we need to, like, empower our medical students that their, their value is there, that they're worth it, and that it's kind of like a courtship. Um, and that's the best analogy I can make. You because you seem pretty happy with your match with Mont Montefiore. Uh, yeah, I, the minute I went there, I knew that's where I needed to be. I just felt like I was home and it really felt a lot like Sophie Davis It's a, and CUNY School of Medicine. It's a very similar culture. A lot of the values are similar. Um, and it just, I guess they felt the same way. Here we are a year later and it's going pretty well. <laughs> Great. Well, it sounds like an exciting week. <laughs> Definitely. So Brianna knows so she maps somewhere. <laughs> what uh, ask, ask the question? So I'm over here. <laughs> Phil's wife. So Brianna knows that she matched somewhere. Correct. Yeah. We're finding out tomorrow where she matched. We uh, already got a celebratory dinner though, because the battle I'm sleep matched. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. And and I hope you match to uh, to the best place for for you. Brianna, on a night like this, my word very frequently is don't eat too little. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> okay. Oops, you're muted. Excuse me. Are there any other uh, qu questions or, or comments? Just to say that was a wonderful presentation and that we all learned a lot and Gives us a good feeling about our days at City College and what, how things are going along now. I do have to leave now. I have another meeting I have to go to, but I really enjoyed your talk. Okay, well, thanks for Thank you joining for us. Uh, Dr. Tweedle, we wish you all the best in your, in your career. Thank you and, for having me. Sounds like that um, uh, the first year on the firing line was, um, was, was been beneficial. Uh, you got. <laughs> yes, you got Training early in in uh, important things and being a doctor, but but it, it 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 sounds like you you learned some early early uh, or or you got some some training in some uh, in in some very important uh, field um, or early on. And I would like to echo what you said and thank your family for all they did for you to help you get here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys, everyone who came in to watch. <laughs> Uh, Bob, Bob, Bob D'Amico, thank, thank you very much for uh, put, putting this uh, together for us. And uh, uh, the, David Covington, thank, thank you very much for hooking us up. And uh, this um, uh, is supposed to be recorded and I'll see how to uh, put, put it up on our Facebook site or we'll put it up uh, someplace conspicuously. Excellent, thank you. So I do, I do want to thank everybody, stay, stay safe. Get your shots and um, uh, continue to practice uh, social distancing. Uh, as I hear, there's, a, there's some peaks coming up. Dr. Fauci uh, is, is, is concerned about it. So we should all be as well. Okay, uh, good, good night Good night to every, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Bye. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice presentation, Dr. Tweedo. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We, we enjoyed that uh, you, you shared your Good story. Job, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Amazing, amazing job.
Thank I enjoyed you. it so much, Victoria. We are so proud of you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Yeah, you tell everyone needs uh, parents and grandparents and family like me. Uh, that I can tell you. <laughs> That's great. Great. All right. Well, good night. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Take care.